Hi, I'm just edit editing the video I took yesterday at East Kirkby on the restoration of the Lancaster. It was a winter tour talk by Andrew Panton. Um, he was explaining how far they've got and where they're going. Um, it was about 45 minutes, 50 minutes long, so I've split it into two. Um, oh, here is the first part. Okay, good afternoon everybody, I'm Andrew. I'm doing the tour for you the, uh, this afternoon. I'm going to talk through what we're doing this winter with the, uh, the restoration of the Lancaster, how we're progressing, what we're going to be doing in the next few years, uh, and pointing out a few things, a few problems we've had, um, and where we are really in the main project to restore the aircraft to Airworthy. And so how many of you have been on a winter restoration tour before? Oh, it's alright then, we'll be doing something right. Um, how many of you have been this year? Good, so a lot of this will be new to a lot of you, which is good. Okay, so this is year three of our 10 year plan to restore the aircraft back to airworthy condition. Uh, year zero, as we're calling it, was the complete paint strip of the outside of the aircraft and the survey on the outer skins of the aircraft and structures to see what work had to be done to get her to airworthy condition. Year one was the, uh, the restoration of a fin and rudder on one side and year two was the opposite side, fin and rudder restoration. Complete breakdown and rebuild back to airworthy condition along with some other survey work and um, various bits of work to the engine or between the engine and the wing. Um, so bulkheads, subframes, engine bearers, undercarriage support beams worked on in those years as well. Um, this year sees uh, quite a bit more structural work uh, so we planned this year originally to do the rear fuselage of the aircraft. So that's from the first transport joint backwards. So if you're looking at this side of the aircraft, from just behind the H back to here, and the other side it would have been just behind the D, thank you, uh, back to here. Um, we'd originally planned to do that, and we ordered or looked at ordering stringer material. And the stringer runs kind of front to back, these small extruded sections here. What we didn't want to happen was to take the aircraft apart, find we needed to order a load of stringers and then find out actually the lead time was so big we couldn't complete the project. So we, we ordered the stringers early before we knew we wanted them, had a bit of a guesswork as to how much material we would actually need. Um, we placed, well, pretty much placed the order with the, the UK company to make them. Uh, until they finally seemingly read the whole email and found out they couldn't make it long enough to what we needed which meant that we actually had to go out to a company in America to have them produced which mean, meant that lead time was longer the time we'd lost earlier on in the, the year meant that actually we couldn't do the, the rear fuselage section this winter because there simply wasn't enough time to get it all done so we had to have a quick change of plan um, we decided to do the very rear section of the fuselage from this former here backwards which uh, is where the tail turret fits in and also to do both wingtips so if you look back at the aircraft both port and starboard wingtip are missing okay so to run through what we've been doing this winter the the rear turret sits in very little structure really so this is the main hoop that holds the weight of the uh, the rear turret and it stretches forward up to the elevators. If you follow the rivet lines, it goes up the side of the fuselage. Um, so it's a very simple thing really to think that we'll start on the rear fuselage section here because it isn't actually disrupting the rest of the, uh, the fuselage um, that goes up the aircraft. It's effectively a bolt-on section. Um, so we took the rear turret off, which is situated behind you. You'll see now there's two rear turrets there. So as you look back, the one on the left is the FN82 and that's the turret from NX611 and the one on the right is an FN121 and that's currently on loan from the Yorkshire Air Museum. One of the problems we have with the project that we're doing is we have six months over the winter to restore the aircraft then six months in the summer she's got to be taxiing again to raise the funds to then spend in the following winter. So our plan to take the turret off and restore the turret was going to take longer than a six month period. So we then had to source another turret to fit into the aircraft to work that summer season to then come out again in the winter. So our FN82 has come out <coughs> this winter, will be restored over the summer period and come, come back again winter 2020 to be refitted to the aircraft. And uh, thankfully our friends at the Yorkshire Air Museum have allowed us to borrow their FN121 turret 
the signal <coughs> to the aircraft. The main differences between those two turrets is the FN82 is fitted with 2.5 Browning machine guns. Um, that's a, a much better turret for um, firing a greater distance. It's got a lot more punch with a higher <coughs> calibre at a greater distance. So when the Mark 7 Lancaster like this one was produced, we had pretty much air superiority um, and we could start to do daytime operations. So the, the FN82 meant that we had much better firepower at a greater distance, which you can see with it being daytime. Whereas the FN121 has got four 303s. Um, so a little bit like rifle rounds, really, rifle bullets. Um, obviously with four of them, they have a good firepower at a closer range, which you need for nighttime, because you can't see them at night until they get a lot closer. Um, so the 121, slightly er earlier turret to the FN82. So NX611 will look very different this summer, taxiing around with a FN121. Um, it's really kind of the turret that everybody thinks of when they think of a Lancaster rear turret. Um, but it's not correct for a, a Mark 7 Lancaster. Okay, so with the rear turret section restoration here, um, quite a lot of parts have had to be replaced, purely due to corrosion. So I'm going to pass this part around. This is what they call an intercostal. Um, and you'll see the level of corrosion on this. This, this part was painted, um, but you'll see that there has been corrosion get underneath the paint and start to eat away at the aluminium section. So all of this is aluminium. It's actually very thick. It's, it's about 18 to 16 gauge, so it's very thick material. And these intercostals actually fit at the bottom of the fuselage. So they rear it in at the bottom of the fuselage all the way around, and that's to add extra strength to the, to the bottom of the, uh, the floor here. Because what they introduced um, to later Lancasters was actually a modification for it to do glider tugging. So it would actually tow a glider. And these forgings here um, are part of the, the glider tug system. So they sit at the bottom of the former here. You put the attachment in and then you can glow a, uh, glow a tiger, um, tug a glider from there. Um, so these, these beefier extra intercostals are put in place um, in there to really beef up the structure. So I'll, I'll pass around an unserviceable one and a serviceable newly made one. <coughs> you can drop the unserviceable one, but please don't drop the serviceable one. So again, that's all just aluminium. It's items we can make on site here with the tooling that we have. So what we have to do with the, the main way that we're restoring the aircraft is it's, it's coming apart completely. All the rivets are coming out, everything's being inspected. So when the item comes off the aircraft, it's paint stripped, inspected, and then goes either in a serviceable, or, sorry, a completely unserviceable pile, a pile to be cleaned up and have the corrosion taken off, or a completely serviceable pile. And so when these are paint stripped, you have to assess if it's got corrosion on it, how deep that corrosion is. Um, with a very thick item, <coughs> it is a bit better because we can lose 10% of the thickness of the material due to corrosion. Um, so when you see it come round, you'll see kind of where the, the line is drawn as to how much corrosion you believe you can clean out compared to uh, how much really makes it unserviceable. So forward of those intercostals sits the final former, the final rib of the fuselage, which is this. So these, it's a two section former, and that sits just in here. And so the, the former forms the shape of the fuselage. So we decided to go as far as this final former, so that when we tackle the fuselage next year, we have a good datum point, a good jigging point to say, from here backwards is airworthy, from here forwards needs to be restored to airworthy condition. So these formers, unfortunately, when they did a modification to this aircraft um, to in, introduce the, the glider tow, they, the work they did to the aircraft makes it not airworthy by today's standards. So on the former here, they cut away the strengthening kick, if you like, and then introduced another extrusion. But the way they did it, the distance the holes that the rivet holes are to the side of the material, the way they left the material itself made it instantly unserviceable and not airworthy by our standards. So that problem, some corrosion on these and some less than ideal holes, we'll call them, 
um, have meant that this item is unserviceable as well. So these have had to be reproduced. The new ones are being painted. So had this tour been this time last week, we'd have had all this fitted before it had come out to be repainted and one of the, fit, one of the wing tips built up before it came apart to be repainted. So slightly unfortunate timing, but I, I tried to get it the best I could. Um, so these new parts have been made by Simone Cunningham, who's based down um, Bournemouth on the south coast. Um, so these have come back, they've been drilled off the original structure and they've gone for painting. From the rear former going right back to the, the back of the extrusion here, it's a very, very light structure but very thick skin. So this is the, the rear part of the hoop that the turret sits in. And this is braced back to the, the bulkhead here by some steel tubes. And then the main strength really for the rest of this structure is made up by thick skins. So these skins obviously form the shape of the, the bottom of, of this section. And they're only held together by, by really thin, um, I, don't, I, haven't, I don't think I've actually got any to show you, but, but a thin strip of aluminium with a little kick in it, which gives it a little bit of extra strength. And that basically holds the skins together. So in this bottom dome, if you like, really the only structure is, is the thick skin, and I'll pass this one around as well. Yep. That's the unserviceable one. So it's the, the thick skin with, with joining plates between. That part had to be reproduced. You'll see there's um, a whack and great hole in it, which for the purposes of a really good story, we'll say the bullet hole, but I think really someone was a bit careless with a screwdriver or something similar. Um, it had a, a quite a poor repair put on it, an in-service repair, probably during its period flying with the French. Um, and it's, it actually managed to go straight through one of the strengthening pieces as well, so it made that unserviceable as well. Um, so we've had to have a new piece made and equally that the partner to it on this side is being reproduced as well. Again, this was produced by Simone Cunningham down in Bournemouth and all this skin is wheeled. Um, so it starts off with a flat piece and they stretch and um, contract, if you like, reduce the amount of material in different areas of the, uh, the skin to form this shape. It took her five hours to wheel that section with it being extremely thick, thick material as well. Uh, her hands were red, red raw after putting it through the, the English wheel. So the way that's, that's produced is on an English wheel. I don't know how many of you know what an English wheel is. Uh, we've got one here, but it's, it's basically uh, a situation where you've got a top wheel and a bottom wheel on rollers, and you, you force the, the material between the two wheels, and depending on how close you have them, how far apart, and what shape of wheel you use, affects the material differently. So you can have it so that it, it stretches the aluminium. And so when you stretch the aluminium, it's got to go somewhere. And so it forms a curve. So depending on where you put the stretch in the material, it takes what shape you get at the end of it. And of course, with a material like aluminium, the more you work it, the more you wheel it, the harder it gets, the more brittle it gets, and the more likely it's going to break, the more likely it's going to crack. So I don't know if you can see in the light in this material, all the little lines in it. So that's where the wheel has been going around the material to add the shape to it. And with this being such a thick material, it is very difficult to put some shape into it as has been required for that. We think that is probably the most curved <coughs> item on the aircraft in one skin. The only thing that's going to compete with it is up at the nose between the, the front turret and the bomb aimer's position. And there's that very tight curve on that material there. So these skins will be drilled off compared to the originals when we have the rest of the structure in here. So all the holes will be put in. The, the skin itself will be trimmed to fit. You can see the, the blue lines are where the original skin was when it was placed against this. Um, so it'll all be trimmed um, using the linisher to, to get the right uh, shape of it. Uh, and then it will be fitted to the aircraft. The colour we have here it looks like primer, but what we've actually done is find the original colour of the inside of this Lancaster when it came off the production line. We found a piece within the, uh, the rear section here that had been sandwiched and so had never been repainted by either ourselves or anybody else in the history of the aircraft. So we managed to send that off, get it colour matched um, and actually have the original colour produced. 
what happened was after the war and later on, because there were so many different colours of interior grey-green, they just really started knocking them off and produced a British standard colour, which is this one. So it's a much, much darker grey-green. Uh, and you can see how it's very different to the, the Avro grey-green, as we're calling it. Um, so when people see this, you're the first members of public to see this, uh, this new colour. Um, but when people see this, I'm sure we'll have a lot of comments saying it's incorrect and why have you painted it that colour and so on and so forth. But we can actually justify why we picked this colour. Um, it went off to be, to be colour scanned. Um, so we have the original piece out of this aircraft and we have two pieces from crashed aircraft as well, crashed Lancasters, and it is this colour. So it's very different to any other Lancaster that's uh, painted inside, um, but it's, this is the original correct colour. So that there are many pieces that have been through the paint shop which all fit into this rear section of, of the aircraft. Um, the final pieces have gone through paint today, so next week we will begin to rivet up the final former of the fuselage and all the bulkhead that attaches to it. This will be riveted into the, the skins as well and then when we receive the rest of this structure back from reproduction the bottom of it can be, um, can be riveted into place as well. Yep. We will then hopefully have received a new version of this. This is steel and it is the turret ring that sits in here. So the turret actually bolts to this, and this is bolts to the extrusion here. So it's quite a thick steel material, and with it being steel, it is obviously rusted. So you can see the brown rust on it, which is the steel corrosion. And then you can see a white flaky material at the bottom, and that is aluminium corrosion. So what you find when you have steel and aluminium together is you get this similar corrosion. So the, the two materials react with each other and start eating away at each other. So the aluminium corrosion there was off this, and the steel corrosion is obviously off this. Now, in true Avro fashion, they had to make everything difficult. So that ring is actually spun. So the method of spinning an item is you have um, a block of former, which is on kind of a lathe, um, and then you have a sheet of, in this occasion, steel, which you spin and then you force it around that formed block. So that item, it was effectively spinning on a lathe and was forced, manually manhandled forced around a former for it to actually make, make the material take the form of the, the former itself. Um, so hopefully the people that are producing it for me are going to video them making it and they should be making it this next week. Um, which will then go out to our Rivet Club members. Anybody a Rivet Club member? Yep. Excellent. Um, so the Rivet Club is a, a weekly newsletter that comes out to everybody for a, a monthly donation uh, to follow the, the restoration work on the aircraft. And um, so if you're a Rivet Club member, um, hopefully you'll get a video come out of them actually making the new version of this. Now, because we are 70 odd years after this aircraft was produced, um, in true aviation aerospace, um, manner that material no longer exists so in order for us to reproduce that um, ring we've had to find out what the original material was find the properties of it and then compare that to another material which you can get um, and then put a mod in a mod costs about 300 pounds to change the material and when the new material has come we've had to take a part off it send it away to a test house they will destroy it to find the properties of it and then you compare the properties of that compared to the original and when they destroy the item it has to be for example this has come off a sheet of material we've had to cut a piece off that exact sheet to send it away because each sheet of material you get can have slightly different properties um, in each, each sheet um, so everything's come back from that test to say it's okay so they've now started production of the actual item so when that comes, it will be rooted, um, it's actually bolted into this ring and we've compared the turret ring against the FN121 turret to make sure it actually fits in. Because of how these things go, you can fully expect that uh, we've got everything in the aircraft ready to go, drop the turret in and nothing fits. <laughs> Fortunately, it fits. Um, so this is it's going to come together quite quickly now. With a restoration project like this, you seem to have months or weeks of 
seemingly very little happening and then you get an awful lot of uh, visual progress um, in a couple of weeks. Um, so this aircraft's got to be out and taxiing for the first week of May, um, which means it's got to be finished for the last week of April at the latest. Um, so all this will be back together again, the turret in by that point, all being well. Okay, so moving from the turret, uh, the other big projects are the wingtips. Um, the wingtips are about nine feet by eight feet. I would love to be able to show you one, but I can't, because um, the wingtips are basically in boxes at the moment. Um,